Persona la explicatriz y bienvenidos a esta sección donde yo sumo todas las entrevistas que voy haciendo cuando me dan chance de ir a hacerla. En esta ocasión voy a entrevistar a Kim Palister, quien es una personalidad de la realidad virtual en Intel y me dieron chance de hablar con él por motivos. Antes de arrancarles esta entrevista, quisiera agradecerle profundamente a la gente bonita de Intel Latinoamérica, quien me llevó a E3 a hablar con el director del Centro de Excelencia de Realidad Virtual en Intel. Hay una cosa que siempre me ha llamado la atención acerca del tema de la realidad virtual y es lo complejo que es venderlo. Entiendes, es de estas cosas que parece medio un poco de culto, porque si no le muestras a alguien lo que es, va a ser muy difícil convencerlo. Entra, pruébalo, ponte el visor. Y si sí, es un poco molesto, literal te estás poniendo unas pantallas enfrente de los ojos a esta distancia y te lo tienes que aguantar por tantas horas para poder vivir dentro de la realidad virtual. Alguien como Kim evidentemente ha estado detrás de una cantidad de las cosas que estamos viendo ahorita con los nuevos procesadores de séptima generación. ¿Qué se le puede preguntar a alguien que vive de hacer tecnología para la realidad? virtual acerca de por qué esto va a ser un éxito. A fin de cuentas, ya tenemos los procesadores, ya tenemos que los desarrolladores de PCs y de consolas están optimizando su hardware para que podamos tener una cantidad de cosas con realidad virtual. Entonces, de cierto modo lo vamos a ver en todas las esquinas. Así que me acerqué y le dije, oye Kim, ¿por qué no funcionó antes? Vámonos con la entrevista. VR es una gran cosa, especialmente que todo el mundo está haciendo VR ahora right y vamos a through a little bit of a hardware refresh. Okay. Um, because that's pretty much what's happening with consoles. You know, PlayStation went from PS to PS4, uh, Pro. Sure. Um, Intel for, uh, is running a uh, seventh generation refresh, which pretty much is set for VR. Yeah. Um, and and I just I've always wondered because I used to be a very a huge VR fan back in the day. Okay. Why like back in the first wave of VR in the yes. 90s and stuff? Cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Why will it work now? Sure. When it didn't work before, and I'd like, just like to hear your word of that. Sure, and I think I think there's a there's a couple of factors that have come to bear that have made this wave of VR a little bit different than the last wave of VR. I think the first thing is we've had um, really high performance 3D graphics uh, systems from the, the the GPUs driving the pixels to the CPUs doing the compute of the rendering of the scenes uh, uh, behind the scenes um, and doing the physics and the AI and the audio and things like that. We've, since that last wave of VR, we've had 20 years, uh, 20 plus years of 3D game development that have really uh, you know, driven that forward. So it's now possible to do uh, real-time 3D very, very quickly. The second really important factor is One of the, uh, there's a great quote from Mike Abrash that uh, affordable, high quality consumer VR is the peace dividend of the smartphone war. And what he meant by that is that just like the, you know, the, the arms race in the past had a lot of technologies that came out of it, right. one thing that was an offshoot of the phone industry was really inexpensive, high quality display panels and really inexpensive sensors. And so the, the technology that goes into the head mounted displays that are being built would never be as affordable as it is if it didn't have these uh, factories building all these really high quality small displays for phones. They're now getting repurposed in the VR space. So that's the second factor. And then the third factor is on the kind of game application and content creation side. It's another offshoot of the the wave of 3D development that's happened on PCs, consoles, and phones is things like Unreal Engine and Unity and other tools that are making it really easy to bring up an application in a VR environment that would have required mountains of code previously. And so it's pretty inexpensive as a cost of entry for a developer to get started with VR development. And that's leading to loads of experimentation, loads of applications in different segments outside of games, things like that. I remember back in the day, you used to have all these extra um, input methods. So you have walkers and yeah. you had all these like sensory, you know, yeah, treadmills, kind of, treadmills and, all, yeah, that, yeah. all that jazz, right? Yeah. Which I have yet to see today. Yeah. Um, is there something coming or or did we just pick up that treadmills were not going to be? <laughs> no, I think I, I think that all of those problems will uh, people will take them on. So when you when you refer to this the second wave, I think we really are at just the beginning right. of a really explosive you know decade of development in in VR, right? And so if you look at um, any of the uh, a, a, any of the vectors of exploration of hardware and software, like let's take input methods, right? right? The, when when the um, Oculus device and, and others kind of debuted, the thinking was, well, it's enough to have your head move around. We'll hand people a gamepad, 
right? And then we that, yes. saw HTC uh, and, and Valve come out with the, the motion track controllers, and immediately people said, okay, that's a vector we've got to go down. When Oculus came out with the Oculus Touch, they said, okay, we're going to add the ability to actually sense if your fingers are on it. Now right. you've got other things. And then Valve at their no last... No one's uh, working with gloves, right? There are some third-party companies doing it, but Valve actually showed a controller, uh, pr it was a prototype, they haven't announced whether they're going to ship it or not, but they showed something that senses the presence of all your fingers, they called it the Knuckles controller, oh, right? right, right? Yes, yes. And so it's handheld and they can say, are you holding, are you not holding, uh, uh, something this, right? Stuff. So you can look at those as examples of like the beginning of a whole area of exploration of how sophisticated does the hand controller get. Maybe it'll be gloves, maybe it'll be some other technology. All right. There are a few third party companies doing things like treadmills uh, and, and other mechanisms for tracking uh, walking and letting you walk in place. And I think from our perspective, uh, this is one of the things that's really exciting about a lot of this happening in the PC industry is it has always been the most kind of uh, Darwinian platform to allow lots of developers to experiment, hardware and software guys to Try experiment. They don't need to seek permission from one platform owner. They can go try something, and if it works, then other people can build on it, right? right. Um, so we're going to see a lot of things happening there. Some of the things aren't going to work. Some are, right. uh, and, and that's a, a pretty exciting area. Everyone's working on ways to get information from your body to the computer. Right. And then you have the screens and you know sensors, yeah. so you, you, you make virtual reality because it's positioned. Sure. Um, is there anything, have you seen, I mean, this is this, away from anything that's commercially available, because yeah. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. Is there anything coming or someone, something that you know that someone's working on that will send information back to you? And Absolutely. So, so, so yeah, yeah. you get shot, you get pushed in. You, sure, you know, sure. So the, you know, the, the way that we think about it is that uh, virtual reality is a, you know, you're, you're driving some kind of a simulation on the machine and you're trying to take as much input in about the, the user and the environment around them, whether that be, like you said, uh, tracking uh, controllers, biometrics, or eye tracking, or things like that. Right. Um, that's all input to the simulation, and we look at what are ways that we can drive things back. And so obviously the visuals is one part. Of course, right. Well, um, the position. And, and audio is a rich vein of like, you can do more sophisticated 3D audio and, and uh, bounce things off materials and locate it in 3D space correctly. And we are seeing people play around with uh, uh, you know, haptics and things like this, so force feedback of different kinds. How will the you get force feedback on your so, the, so the simplest version of that is even the, the Vibe controllers today have simple like vibration and, and this kind of thing. That's a start. Right. Um, we have a, 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 I'm going to forget the name of the product. We have a, a vendor in China that used an Intel Curie processor in a force feedback vest for VR. Vest. Uh, it's a vest that you wear, and I mean, it's an early product and they have some interesting demos, but it's an example of these companies trying different things. In their case, they put little actuators uh, in, I think it's like six places on the front and two in the back, so that, you know, if, if the zombie's coming at you from behind and you feel it on the back of the shoulder, you know to turn around and, and uh, shoot them that way, right? Wow, okay. Yeah. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of challenges in these kind of wearable things. You have to accommodate people of different size. You, you know. It, how snug this have to be so that you feel the impact and stuff, but that's why uh, it's a really interesting area for people to experiment within the PC and find what works. When you play with a controller, you're sitting down, when you're playing on VR, you you are designing this because you want yeah. people to stand up and move and do things, right? Sure, this absolutely. Is, this is the end goal, yeah. right? You want people to play around. Yeah, I mean, you want a, uh, a set of technologies and systems that allow people to simulate whatever environment they want. Some of those might be sitting down. If you are emulating the, being the driver of a Formula One race car, you want to be sitting <laughs> right. down, right? right? But yeah, uh, something like Job Simulator is a great example. If you, if you want to be a short order cook, you should be standing up and move around the kitchen and do stuff, right? right. And then, yeah, there's a lot of challenges to overcome of, um, you know, once you start looking at uh, how to locate people in a larger environment, but you have to do this all from, let's say, your living room, right. you know, that's where we see people have tried things like locomotion or versus uh, teleporting and stuff. And, you know, we're pretty confident that, that the developer community is, you know, very creative in like figuring out ways to do that, right? Like somebody came up with that teleporting mechanism and then other people come up with variants of it. And so uh, th these problems will get solved over time. But we're only at the beginning of a very long road. I've yet to see, and I think this will be a fairly large area of exploration for VR, uh, virtual attendance to events. So sure. let's say you can't make it to E3, 
but you can have a uh, 3D camera robot yeah. <laughs> going by. I've actually, I'm trying to remember which event it was at. I've seen that. I saw some. I saw a virtual presence robot at an event that someone was attending. I'm gonna forget which I, I conference can see it was at. Uber making money out of that. You know, yeah, like, possibly, like. <laughs> possibly, yeah. And I, you know, so I'm not uh, sure there's ever a substitute for like sitting down to dinner right. with someone. But if you can't make it, that's a good way to do it. And I think that giving people control over where they can take their virtual presence is an interesting idea. Well, what's in the very near future for uh, Intel and VR? Just, just for. Sure. So we're doing a number of things involved in helping to take it to the to the larger market and take it into different uh, into vectors, so I, different spaces. And so the recent announcement that we had um, with ESL around esports and what we're doing there. So we're doing a number of things in esports, but in particular as it pertains to VR, we announced a uh, challenge league where we're going to be bringing a couple of uh, game titles, um, the Unspoken. And uh, from the developers of Lone Echo, a title called Echo Arena, which we're showing over at our booth in four-on-four -four multiplayer, we're going to be bringing a VR esports uh, competition Monica to these Arena. events that we do, right? And so we, people will be able to log in and view people battling in these virtual arenas and and uh, going, you know, one-on-one -on -one or four-on-four, -four, which is going to be really cool. And there'll be, you know prizes and uh, a community of people to build up. So that's going to help build the popularity for VR. Right. Then there's a number of things we're doing on the technology side, two of which we have demos of here. Um, in terms of showing the benefits of more processing power to VR, we're working with developers to uh, highlight new features and bells and whistles. If you have the latest Core i7 processor, there'll be extra stuff that appears in your VR title, making it more immersive. Okay. Uh, so we did things over the past year with titles like Arizona Sunshine and Star Trek Bridge Crew to show that kind of yes. thing off, and we'll be doing more going forward. Um, we're also looking at usages like uh, the mixed reality green screening to let people that are doing VR, whether for esports or they're a YouTuber or a game streamer, share those experiences with others and stream them to let people uh, know what they're doing. Um, we're also looking at a number of the things that we need, that the industry needs to do to make VR more usable and bring it to a broader audience. So for example, the PC solutions have the best performance, have the best graphics, they have the most immersion, but they have a big cable hanging off your, uh, hanging off your head. Yes. Right? And so uh, we've been working uh, back at Computex a few weeks ago. We announced a collaboration with HTC, where HTC is going to be using Intel's Y gig, uh, 60 gigahertz wireless technology how to build an app. How much data goes through that cable? Uh, I don't remember in terms of megabits, but I mean, it's the full it's live resolution. It's a it's a fair amount at 90 frames per second, plus the sensor data going back the other way. Those, those things are running at 90 frames per second? Yes, yes, that's right. And they have to run at a fairly low latency to be very responsive, right? Right. And so uh, they're going to be building a, an accessory for the HTC Vive that removes the wire and powers it off of this module. And this is a uh, prototype of it that we have here. What is your favorite VR uh, experience to show to new people? To show to new people, I tend to focus on things that they can very quickly kind of get up and running and, so, uh, and that they don't require a lot of training. So, uh, like the game that we have running behind me, uh, uh, Space Pirate Trainer, is game mechanics wise, an old school 80s arcade game. Like somebody described it as uh, you are Han Solo inside of Galaga. Right, so it's just aliens come up in front of you, and, and or uh, you know spaceships come up in front of you, and you shoot at them, but you actually have to physically move to dodge their bullets coming back the other way. And so anybody that's played an arcade game that they put a quarter in back in the 80s uh, is able to kind of get the game mechanic, and then it's like they're they're instantly in VR. So that's a fun one. Uh, there's also a lot of the kind of uh, cartoonish, uh, humorous things that. Um, that, that uh, like a job simulator or Rick and Morty that, that people right. kind of get some, some humor out of it right away. ¿Cómo lo vieron? Ojalá hubiera podido tener más tiempo con él. En últimas, no saben cuánto me abre los ojos poder platicar con alguien que ha tenido sus manos en la masa con estas cosas y que además siempre te queda el bichito de y hay algo que no me estás diciendo, ¿no? Pero bueno, ya saben, si tienen algún amigo fan geek de la tecnología de los videojuegos, Compartan esta entrevista y si no, por lo menos dejen aquí sus dos en los comentarios. Cualquier duda que sienta que yo pueda responder. En últimas, aquí estaré leyendo. Los quiero mucho. ¡Muah!